Oh, no, it's not seven yet. Is this actually officially seven? Okay, I think we just start. Huh? Okay, my, my name is Linus. Um, and uh, today, uh, welcome to, to Creative Crew, by the way. Uh, this is my partner here, uh, Leon. So we run the uh, Creative Crew talks uh, on every second Tuesday of the month. So this is the topic for, uh, for November. Uh, uh, myself, uh, I've um, uh, tr uh, traveled the world to take uh, uh, pictures of... Uh, and I love, particularly love to take photos of sunsets, you know, I don't know, I suppose that you guys are here because you guys have the same interest as me. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that I felt, and uh, the reason why I wanted to share this topic, uh, just to give you guys a little bit of a background, is because uh, for a, a long time, I found that there isn't a lot of information, on the, even on the internet, when you try to search this topic. There are people who give you very surface level kind of information on taking photos of the sunset, that more of it on the technique side. Okay, uh, should you use a tripod, should you not use a tripod, what kind of lens should you use, what kind of filter should you use. That kind of information, you can get that a lot if you try to Google it, try to search it. But predicting the sunset, that's another area now. I mean, even when you say predict, it is it's still a change. When you say predict, a, the word prediction means that it's a such chance of error. Okay, so like, no, I don't think that anybody can rightfully uh, dare to say that say, I can predict the sunset today 100%. No, no way. And, Surprisingly, uh, one of why I managed to get onto a bit of the information is when I went storm chasing one year. You know, I I, I started doing short storm chasing back in like 2012. Uh, went to Arizona. Uh, went to, so uh, the people who led the storm chasing trip, they were very very knowledgeable with the weather. You know? So I started learning about the weather from them. And so and I started to realize that in order to predict sunsets, you need to be a bit of a meteorologist. You know, you need to take an interest, you need to read up. So I, I ended up reading like really, really a lot of articles on things that I never thought that I would read, you know, or like Google documents, and it's like people's uh, opinion on whether or not rain showers affect humidity, whether or uh, what is dew point, and what, all these kind of new meteorological um, terminologies that I never ever come across in my life before. I started taking an interest in it. So I thought that, hey, you know, since we have a session in November, I thought, you know, why not we can try to share this session. Uh, and I can, uh, and a lot of these are kind of like my theories as well. So uh, if you guys have any experience, uh, you've got to correct me. If there's any, what I'm worried about is that are there any meteorologists in our, in this group here? You know, that's what I'm worried because meteorology is not really my speciality, you know, but it's, it's just something that I happen to have an interest in and I read I mean, my background is in photography. So, but you need to also kind of make sense of that meteorology to kind of see how that actually applies to photography. So that's, that's what I'm trying to present today. Okay. So you see the first, the first uh, caption that I have for you today is like, capturing the perfect sunset or sunrise doesn't even matter. Let's start with this first picture over here. Okay. Uh, like, like if I show you this picture here, right, can you even tell that is it a sunrise or sunset? How many people think it's a sunset? <laughs> sunrise? Okay, most people say it's a sunrise. Okay, and honestly, why do you think it's a sunrise? What, what gave it away that it's a sunrise? The what, sorry? Okay, yeah, actually it's true. Okay, yeah, uh, uh, actually, you know, you, you kind of jumped the gun a little bit, you know, because when I, uh, the only difference that I, that I feel, you know, having taken sunsets and sunrise is that there is a higher chance of fog in the morning. Yeah, we, we all know that because the, the air temperature drops a lot more. Uh, and uh, it tends to also get less humid. Okay, actually, humid is. After a while, right, I also learned that humid is the wrong terminology to use. Later on, I will explain that. You know, why is it a humidity? We always talk about humidity in Singapore. And then, you know, one thing that kind of blew my mind one day is that I'm actually reading up on the wrong thing all this time. Right? <laughs> that uh, we shouldn't even be looking at humidity. You know, like what makes us what what makes us feel hot in Singapore is actually not the humidity. Okay, we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, in, in a while, okay, but okay, good, you know, the fogginess, right, and uh, and I actually asked quite a few people before this session, just as a bit of a test bed to see whether or not I'm, uh, is that people tend to have this uh, mindset that if you don't see people in the picture, it's probably a sunri uh, sunrise, and if you see people in the picture, because it, it tends to, because during sunset there's a lot more people, they tend to predict that it's uh, a sunset. Okay, but really, what I'm uh, here to tell you is that among the pictures that are taken, other than the fog, 
most of the time, sunrise and sunset looks almost exactly identical. The only way you can tell is that if you are familiar with the location, like you are, you live in that area, you know where the sunrise and where the sunset. You know, so that you can actually tell whether it's the sunrise and the sunset. But in Singapore, most of the time, it kind of looks the same. In most parts of the world, it, uh, it, it, it looks almost exactly identical. Okay, so. Um, So, but I guess, you know, before we even start to have this, this talk, right, we, we need to answer this question, like what qualifies as a nice sunset, right? We, we, so is it a sunset that, that looks the one on, like the one on the left, or is it the one that looks on the right? right? This is kind of debatable, right? This is up, kind of comes down to like personal taste, like whether or not, whether should there be clouds, should there not be clouds, or should the shot be shot with a white shot, with a white, white angle ledge? Kind of, could it be a close-up? So this kind of comes down a lot to aesthetics, uh, and we don't want kind of don't want to go there in today's talk because it's almost like talk, talking about whether this picture is nicer uh, by Jackson or oh sorry I got kind of like the uh, the artist wrong. Okay, this is by Jackson or uh, that is by uh, Rothko. Okay, so I put a wrong name there. Okay, the, so that is Mark Rothko and this is Jason Paul. So, it's all, so uh, what I want you guys to do right, is to think of the sky as a canvas. And whatever we have in front of it, the colors, the clouds, is just a, like a little painting that goes in front of it. Okay, so it's almost like an analogy. This is better or this is better? So it's almost like saying, is a Rothko better or is a Jackson Paul painting better? It really comes down to personal taste, right? right? Okay, so this is a photo by uh, Peter Lick. Okay, and the reason why I want to show you guys this picture as the first photo <coughs> is because uh, you look at this, I mean, this is, he's obviously using, um, uh, he's obviously a world-renowned photographer and, and he probably spends camps there every single morning. Uh, I, know, I know for a fact that this is a sunrise because this is Huntington Beach and I've been to Huntington Beach and I know that the sunrise from this direction and the sun sets on the other direction. So. Then again, you know, if you're familiar with the location, it's possible to tell that it's a sunrise or a sunset. On the sunset, there tends to be a lot more people walking along that bridge as well, you know, because uh, I've been there before. Um, so, if you look at all the clouds there, okay, I think it's quite undeniable that clouds plays a big part in the formation of a sunset, okay. Uh, and how, so we need, in order for us to understand uh, the, the formation of the clouds, we need to do a little, I did a little bit of research in clouds. So this is kind of like secondary school stuff, and you guys have, uh, and I'm sorry that if I make you revisit like nightmares doing geography class in um, <laughs> secondary school, but, but in order for us to understand the clouds, uh, the formation of clouds, we need to know what kind of a different clouds there are in the sky, okay? So if you see this kind of clouds, and we do see this from time to time, at this time of the year, a bit hard because this is the rainy season. Um, but this is what we call cirrus clouds, and they are high level clouds. They are the highest level clouds that you can get because they are above about five, above 5,500 meters. And these are the kind of clouds that kind of looks like paint strokes. Again, I don't want to get into aesthetics preferences. Okay, whether you like it or not, we're not going to go down that road. Okay, but this kind of looks like paint strokes that goes across the sky. Okay, imagine yourself. Imagine this as a sky, this is your canvas, and this is your painting, okay? So what kind of a clouds, what kind of a combination of clouds that you want, I leave that up to you, okay? I'm just going to explain it. This is what we call uh, cirrocumulus clouds, or in short, we just call it cereal clouds, okay? Just so that I don't have to say cirrocumulus. Uh, they are also considered high-level clouds. They are about 6,000 meters uh, to 12,000 meters. They're so quite high up there in the sky, and you will notice them as they are clumpy little ripples. Okay, I tend to call them ripply clouds. So you can see this this example that I have there. You can see tiny little clouds forming like almost ripples across the sky. Okay, it's almost like you take a little paintbrush and you just cut that 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 on the canvas. That's the kind of clouds that you get. Okay, again, I'm using painting as an analogy here. And these are auto cumulus clouds. So you. Uh, they are quite similar to the zero clouds, but they are, tend to be a little bit more puffy, like uh, I would say cotton wool would be, tiny little cotton wool, you know like cotton balls that women use to kind of clean up their makeup, they are kind of like those little cotton balls, and you get the tiny little bits of them in the sky, okay? Um, 
of course, when we have clouds, right, we very, very seldom have just one kind of clouds uh, or the other kind of clouds. Like this is a combination of zero and alpha clouds side by side. And I like this picture because they are not mixed together. Very rarely do you actually see this because uh, most of the time they will be mixed together. And when I say mixed together, it will be something like this. So this is a mixture of zero and auto clouds together. And you can see that you know they tend to form very nice colors because they, it's, a, it's, it's almost like you're a painter and you just kind of like you brush across the sky and just dab. And when you have the color comes in, you know you get a very, very nice canvas uh, in the sky. Okay? And last but not least is your cumulus clouds. And these are your low hanging clouds. Okay, these are below. 2,200 meters. Okay, so these we get a lot in Singapore because we are uh, we're a tropical uh, country and uh, there tends to be a lot of rain. We're in the tropics, uh, high humidity as well. Uh, so the problem with cumulus clouds is that too much of these is going to ruin your sunset. Okay, so it's good to have some of these around, but too much of it you are going to get a lot of cloud cover. And later on, we're going to talk about uh, coverage. We're going to talk about the uh, we'll talk about we're going to talk about some of the websites and apps that you can actually go go to get these kind of information over here. Okay, so I just want to do a little bit of introduction of the clouds first. Hi guys, yeah. please have a seat. <laughs> I just want to do a little bit of introduction to all the different kind of clouds first, so that at least you know we know what we are dealing with. <laughs> okay, this is a shot that I took in uh, Mount Romo. Uh, any of you have been to Mount Romo before? Uh, quite near, uh, just off Surabaya. And the reason why I wanted to show this picture uh, is because, you see, because Mount Romo is so high above sea level, you actually get above the cumulus cloud. It's 2,000 over meters uh, above sea level. So you can see that by the time we are, we, we, I'm shooting the, this is a sunrise, by the way. Uh, by the time you're shooting the sunrise, I'm above the clouds, and what, I, what you have in the back there are just the cirrus clouds and there are some zero clouds around. You, know, you don't actually get, uh, you have absolutely zero cumulus clouds left. Okay. So one of the ways that you can actually get uh, a better sunset or sunrise is to actually get high up in the altitude. Okay. Um, so cumulus clouds, you know, you the, the one thing that is good about cumulus clouds is that when there's, uh, there's some of it, and this I actually saw, uh, shot it in Tucson, Arizona, is that you sometimes get this kind of God rays effects that's, uh, that's bouncing off the clouds. And this actually worked out quite well for me because uh, this was actually shot uh, shortly after a habu, you know, a habu, if you uh, didn't know, it's actually a sandstorm. A uh, sandstorm that just go by, and you know, the rain cleared it, and then uh, I got very, very nice clear skies behind. And uh, yeah, so that was quite a magical evening. Uh, so cumulus clouds, you know, uh, in abundance doesn't really work so well, but a, a small amount of cumulus clouds uh, tend to work in your favor sometimes. Mm. Okay, so we're going to get to the more meteoro uh, meteorological part of my presentation. So I, I, I apologize if it gets a little bit scientific, uh, but unfortunately to explain this, we have to get into a little bit of the science of it. Okay. Now, um, it, what is important now, we, we sometimes wonder why is it that sometimes we get a very nice sunset in Singapore. Most of the time we don't get nice sunsets in Singapore. There are places in the world where almost every day, like one of the places that I've been to is um, uh, Naples, Florida. Where if you ever been to Naples, Florida, which is on the west side of Florida, every day is a nice sunset. You know, like every almost every single day of the year, and it's a lot to do with the kind of weather and the kind of air uh, the kind of uh, uh, humidity, the kind of air, uh, air temperature that they have over there. So, uh, so I'm going to start off by talking about air quality. Now, first of all, we have to realize that light has to travel uh, from the now every day the sun will set, and the, the only difference is what's separating it is the layer of clouds and the atmosphere the layer of atmosphere that's separating between the light that's coming from the sun and when it reaches your camera, which is at ground level. So, that layer of atmosphere matters a lot. Okay, and it's the deferring atmosphere that actually makes the difference between a nice sunset and a terrible sunset, like today. Um, because one thing that you have to realize, if you see this small little diagram over here, is that um, now, when you guys do the uh, color temperature on your camera, you know, you have settings like cloudy, you have settings like shady, 
right? And most of the time, is to counter the blue that's in the sky, right? So it, it, it either veers more towards the yellow, or it veers more towards the blue. And the reason why it counteracts the blue is because blue has the shortest wavelength among all the different colors. So because it has the shortest wavelength, it has the most uh, it has the most likelihood, the chances of it being scattered is the highest. And the reason why we have very dull and overcast day is because when the, especially when it's cloudy like today, when the light comes through the, the, the dense clouds, scatter, all the blue light scatters. Uh, the reason, and when you have, let's say, things like uh, uh, haze, like what we do have a lot in Singapore, uh, the haze will actually uh, the blue light will be scattered due to the haze and we get very, very dull, kind of, uh, very, very ordinary looking kind of days. Okay? So these are the kind of things that can actually affect the air quality, which will affect your sunset. Uh, haze, smog, uh, fog, which we'll talk about in a, in, a, in a while, and also the wind. Okay? The wind actually plays a big factor because wind is what brings in the fog. Uh, it brings in the fog, it brings in the smog, brings in the haze. So the wind right, actually plays a big factor in air quality and also, the, and also will affect the, predict, the predictability of your sunset uh, as we start to look at the other kind of factors that will affect the sunset. Okay, so, um, so I start you guys with this. So the important thing to note here is that blue light scatters more easily than any other color. Okay, we will follow up on this. Right, so you notice that we tend to get more dramatic sunsets after a rain. Um, and a lot of the time when I do photography classes, the one advice that I give students is, you know, if it rains, uh, don't give up, you know, because it's like if it's raining, I'm, I'm actually happier because the rain's actually cleaning up the air for me. And when it cleans up the air, you know, we cleans up all the haze, it cleans up all the smoke, all the kind of particles that's in the air, all gets cleaned up, okay? So think of it as just a, like a little shower uh, for you. So chances of a nice sunset are actually higher. So if your rain stops at four, great, fantastic. Take your camera, go out, you know. Because, uh, of course, there are other kind of factors to think about as well, but uh, the nature has really done you a great favor by cleaning up the air for you, okay? Okay, so that's why sunset tends to look better uh, over oceans and more dramatic over uh, open seas or over o open oceans for that matter. And this is one that I took in, uh, I can't even pronounce the name of that place, it's called Delno Wigan State uh, Pass State Park. And this is actually somewhere near uh, Naples, Florida as well. You know? And uh, I actually snuck into this. The story with this is, this is actually a restricted area. Nobody's actually allowed in here. It's owned, by, it's owned by private condominiums. We have to hop a fence to get inside here. So we're not supposed to be there. Just went in, passed security, took a nice photo, there were people there, and then I, I just left. Okay. Um, but you can see why this state land, this land is owned privately by condominiums because this is the view that they get every single day. <laughs> and the weather there is just perfect for sunsets, okay? Because it's near the ocean, right? Uh, either near the ocean or this is over open oceans. Okay, this is uh, Cape Coral. So uh, near the Gulf of Mexico. All right, so I was actually on the boat when I took this. So this is over open oceans. And this, by the way, is not Photoshop. Okay? You might think that I actually, a lot of people, the first question, you know, like sometimes a lot of people ask is that you Photoshop this picture, right? <laughs> did you increase the saturation? Uh, no, I did not. This is like literally how the photo looked like. You know, I didn't, if I saturate this even further, it will be oversaturated. So no satur no hue and saturation required for this. Okay, so we come to the part where we need to also talk about humidity, all right? Um, now, Humidity is caused by the saturation of water particles in the air. Don't forget, water particles in the air, just like fog, just like haze, they will also scatter the blue light. So unfortunately in Singapore, where we live in a country of high humidity, we don't get a lot of nice sunsets because the, humid, the water in the air scatters the light and everything becomes a lot more dull. Everything will have a little bluish hue, bluish tint. Across it, right? So and that makes the sunset dull, uh, dull effect. Okay. In general, the lower the humidity, uh, there's a higher chance of a dramatic sunset. Now, that's not to say that we, we don't have days where we have low humidity in Singapore. Humidity does go up and down in Singapore, and there are days where humidity significantly drops. Okay. Now, having said that, um, okay, and this is one thing that I 
that uh, I was debunked up. There's a lot of, if you're going to read up on the internet, there's probably a lot of uh, conflicting information on this, okay? To the point whereby I actually probably read, read about four or five different papers before I made sort of like a deduction. The, the argument whether or not rain showers lower air humidity, some people say yes, some people say no. If you Google it, there are probably be some people who say yes. Okay, but I think that in general, people tend to favor no. That is, uh, rain showers do not actually lower air humidity. People tend to think that it lowers air humidity because they feel cooler after. That's because the, land, the air temperature drops. There is no doubt, air temperature will drop after a rain shower because there's a period of time where the sun doesn't actually hit and the, the, the rain shower actually has a, a cooling effect on the air. But it's not actually the humidity that drops. I'm going to introduce you guys to a new terminology. A, a terminology that when I first found out, it kind of, it just blew my mind. Because it's like, for the first time, somebody actually told me that humidity has got nothing on the stuffiness that you feel or the air temperature that you feel. Like in Singapore, we always say that you feel hot because it's humid, okay? And I can tell you that this, you don't feel hot because it's humid. There is humidity in the air, but it's not due to the humidity. Like, I'm gonna give you an example of San Francisco, okay? Now, when I visited San Francisco in 2013, I found out something, now, because I was trying to use the stats, I, I'm a very stats person, okay? And the reason why I wanna give this talk is because I can t I'm trying to tell you that you can use statistics to predict a good sunset, right? So, obviously, naturally, when I went to San Francisco, I, first thing I did, look up humidity, look up all the stats in the weather. I found out something that is quite surprising. You know, when you go to San Francisco, you'll find that you need to wear a jumper most of the time because it's quite cold over there. Then when I look at the humidity, I realize that the humidity is always above 80. San Francisco's humidity level is actually almost similar to Singapore. You know, and most people don't think that because they think that you know, San Francisco is so cool. It can't, be, it can't be that high, but actually it's true. It's about 87% most of the time. Okay? And that's why if you look at the sunset, right, it's not that hot. It's not that great, it's okay. This I actually took, uh, this, is not the San, this is not the Golden Gate Bridge, this is the Bay Bridge. I found that this angle was better because it actually shows the whole financial hub at the back there. So I actually used Google Maps to find this location. It's just right next to the sea. And I took the shot right about sunset. Not too happy with how the sunset turned out, but it was okay. And this on the other hand, this is uh, Huntington Beach in California, where the humidity is 65%. Now this here is taken just literally three days down the road. Okay, so you can see a, quite a good comparison of the, and during the summer, the weather conditions remain relatively the same if it's over the whole week. So just to show you the difference that the humidity can make on the sunset of uh, uh, two locations, just not too far apart. Uh, San Francisco and Huntington Beach is just down the stretch of California. Okay, major difference in the results. So, which brings me to viewpoint. Okay, this is the this is a term that I told you guys about that when I first found out about it, it kind of blew my mind. How many of you have heard of viewpoint before? Or seen it somewhere before? Um, now, because viewpoint and humidity, these two things are the most common terminologies that are confused between the two. Viewpoint, by definition, if you look at this, is the temperature to which air must be cooled to become saturated with water vapor. Okay? Uh, the average dew point in Singapore, by the way, is around 24 degrees Celsius, okay? Which means that if the air rises, okay, on the ground level, it's not actually that humid. But when it, when it goes up, when the air goes up, and it reaches the height in which the temperature becomes 24 degrees Celsius, that becomes saturated with water vapor, okay? Of course, because of factors like wind and air circulation, the water vapor doesn't always stay at one point. It kind of circulates around. And we feel, we feel hot, we feel stuffy because of the high, because of the high dew point, it's keeping the water vapor quite low. It is possible to actually have a high humidity at a low dew point where the water vapor will stay high up in the air and even though the, air, even though the humidity may be high in the 80s and 90s, but you don't actually feel that hot because all the humidity is all up there way beyond, nearer towards the sky. And we at ground level don't actually feel the humidity. I know it's a bit of a tough concept to grasp. Um, I do actually have a diagram to show you, okay? Let me just show you this diagram first, okay? I invented this diagram myself. This diagram, you know, I tried to find something online, but it doesn't exist. So this is how I'm gonna explain it to you guys, okay? 
Now, if let's say, for example, if the humidity is constant, it's the same. Let's say about 80, let's say it's about 87, 85, okay? If this is the ground level, this is the air temperature, and around the clouds, it's usually about 10 degrees Celsius, all right? Um, if, the, if the dew point is high, like in Singapore, the moist air will stay around the low area here, okay? And what that, sorry, the, uh, I do point a little bit, okay. The moist air will stay, will stay low. So we get affected more by the moist air and hence we feel humid as a result of the moist air very close to the ground level over here. But if you have a very low dew point, even if your humidity is up there in 87 range, all the moist air is up there near the clouds. So up, we are here and it's cooling. It's, we don't get affected by the humidity. But how does that all have an effect on the photography? Now don't forget the moist air is the layer of air that scatters blue light. When you have a huge layer of moist air here like this, what it does to your, the quality of your light is that throughout this entire barrier, light will be scattered all over the place. All your light will turn, and you get a lot more, uh, you tend to have a lot more uh, dull and, uh, and, and blue cast uh, around everything that you shoot. Whereas if you have a situation like this, tendency is that, you know, because of the small barrier where your light has to go through that is moist, or in some countries where it's so dry, you don't even get affected by that moist air as well, you will tend to have a much better sunset this way. Okay? So remember the San Francisco when I, when I told you guys about? San Francisco is actually quite an interesting place because San, the, the humidity and dew point of San Francisco is actually almost exactly identical to Singapore. High humidity around the, the high 80s and also a very high dew point around 24 degrees Celsius. The only difference between San Francisco and Singapore is that the air temperature tends to drop a lot lower because of its locality. So what happens when the air temperature drops below dew point? Anyone wants to guess? What does San Francisco have a lot? Anyone been to San Francisco? When you go to San Francisco, it's a really difficult place to photograph because every day you are affected by something called fog. That's right. When temperature drops below dew point, you get fog. And San Francisco, you get fog all the time. So, in order for you to understand why fog appears, it's because high humidity, lots of moisture in the air. High dew point, moisture staying really low. But because the temperature drops so low, it may drop to 21, 20, 19 degrees, it's below the dew point, all the moisture in the air turns into fog. And that's why you get, and that's why the gentleman over there, he said, mist in the morning, you're right, you know. So it's, even in Singapore, sometimes we do get mist in the morning if the air temperature drops down low, below the dew point. Rare in Singapore, yes, but it does happen. Okay, we've seen this already. So. How are we going to solve this problem? If you want to get rid of this problem, all this moist air and barrier, one of the ways that you can do, that, that most common thing that you can do, try to get high up, you know. The higher up you get, the less barrier that you have between the light and your camera. And you tend to get better sunsets that way. Uh, if you guys have ever been to anywhere high altitude to shoot, whether it's just shooting people, or just shoot, or shooting sunsets, you'll find that even the quality of the light hitting your subject actually looks a lot better. You know, you, you don't you don't get that uh, you don't get the, uh, the the dispersion of the light. You know? very it's almost like just putting a, a light on that person. You get very nice wind lights. You get very nice shadows on them. Uh, so high altitude, okay, is one of the uh, my advice for you. Uh, places that are dry, okay. This is Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. I was there last autumn. Okay, so very very dry. And so that they are, when there's a lot less moisture in the air, you can see that the, the colors really, really comes out. Uh, this is, uh, I believe this is a sunrise shot, and not a sunset shot. Okay, cloud formations. Okay, what was I going to say about this? Um, ah, so in Singapore, uh, one of the things that we could do, and what I tend to do is to look out your window at about 4 o'clock in the evening. Okay? Cloud formations is not something that we can that we can control, it's nature. So, you look, the, the best way to know how the clouds are going to look at sunset is to look out the window at about 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. If you look at that, you see this, chances are the sunset is going to look really nice. If you see that there's clouds all over the sky, or no clouds at all, then probably, you know, okay, it's okay, another day maybe, 
Okay, so use a little bit of this predictive intelligence when you guys are decide. So I know that some photographers go by feel. Say, oh, I got feel today, you know. So maybe I should take my camera and we go out. You know? But then it ends up, oh, terrible sunset. Never mind. We try again another day. But surely there has to be. And the reason why I do this is because I feel there needs to be a bit more of a science to this hit and miss. You know, we can't be going out and hit and miss every day, right? So rain showers. Look for that. I'm always very happy when it rains and it stops around four o'clock. If it rains and stops at four o'clock, look out the window. Okay, see how the clouds are doing. Rain's good because get rid of all the low-lying cumulus clouds, right? We are left with more of the high-level clouds, which forms the very, very nice patterns. Okay. Um, okay, wind. This is this is one of our biggest enemy. Okay, because if you you can look out the window and it looks. Uh, and I got a friend there, you know, and I always message him, okay, he's, and, and we're always messaging each other at about 4 o'clock, it's like, okay, it looks good now, you know, how's the wind? And the wind is always the killing factor, because it's like, with wind, right, no matter how nice your cloud looks, uh, the wind can blow it away, okay? Yeah, you're, you are, look, Singapore is small, you know, we're looking at, and the nice places that you have in Singapore, Chinese gardens, you know, uh, Changi Beach, Broadwalk Beach and all this, they are within a vicinity of a few kilometers. And when you have wind going past three kilometers per hour, that's going to drastically change in one hour. Just think of a science that way, right? If something is blowing at three kilometers per hour, your wind, your cloud can move at three kilometers per hour. It's just vapor. Okay, so yeah, so you can see this. This uh, I shot this at Wellington, Kansas. So the like, cloud looks good when I was getting there, but when I got there, the wind has already destroyed most of my clouds. Well, nothing I can do about it. Okay, this is weather.gov.sg, uh, great website. Uh, I love this website because it doesn't just give you the wind, but it gives you the wind at the different parts of Singapore and telling you the speed of the wind and the direction of the wind that is blowing. Okay, so if there's uh, any particular spot that you're looking for, now obviously we are at one spot, and I can most likely I'll be at work at about four o'clock, so I can only look out the sky at where my workplace is, but. If you have friends who live in different areas, you know, you can ask them to kind of... I kind of wish that we have like little spy cameras that the weather can kind of like set up at different parts of Singapore where they can tell us how the clouds actually looking. If anybody knows of anything like that, you know, maybe we can share the information. But uh, if you have friends living or working at different parts uh, of the island, you know, maybe you can ask them to help out. Hey, can you take a picture of the sky for me? How does it look like in Bedok? How does it look like in Changi? How does it look like in Jurong? You know, then we can kind of maybe if you want to take photos, make a better decision on which part of the island you want to go to for your sunset. So this will help you with the wind. So you want to try to avoid two windy areas where you have calm winds, you know, that's good because you know that the clouds are going to stay that way, at least for the next hour or so. Okay, so, but having wind is not altogether a bad thing, okay. Now I don't want to, I, I don't want to kind of diss one thing or another. Now this is actually a quite a lucky situation where I was in Colby, Texas, I was storm chasing as well. So this was actually a massive cell structure, you know. During the June period in the US, you tend to have this massive cell structure that could actually potentially become like hurricanes, not hurricanes, what they call those, uh, tornadoes, okay. Uh, so it came out, it was a very, very nice uh, cell structure. And then when the wind came, this whole thing collapsed. You can see that it collapsed over the entire field. And, it, this, and these kind of formations have a name and they are called shelf clouds. Okay, weather forecast. Uh, I don't actually like the local meteorological forecast in Singapore. It doesn't give us a lot of information. Most particularly, it doesn't give me dew point. I don't know why, but local meteors, uh, meteor stations right, don't give us dew point. What I like, I like IntelliCast. This is really good. Uh, I like AccuWeather. AccuWeather also gives you dew point. In fact, these two, why I point out these two is because they give you the dew point and humidity by the hour. So you get every single hour because you know that the dew point and humidity tends to drop as we hit sunset. Okay, so what it is at 3 p.m. is most likely going to be very, very different than what it is at about 6 p.m. And sunset, we know that's always around the kind of same time in Singapore. Okay, um, yeah, you can see that that actually gives you uh, by the hour, tells you that the air temperature, uh, we, can, we can just ignore the fuse light. The fuse light has a lot to do with the viewpoint. You can see the humidity and the viewpoint, and the viewpoint you can see kind of usually stays between 24 to 25 degrees. So we know that this is not, if you look at this stats, right, you know, you know that you're not going to have 
a nice sunset today. You know, this this whole thing just tells the whole story for you. So go go with these kind of apps, uh, go with these kind of websites because uh, it, it kind of gives you the preparation whether or not you should just pack your stuff and head out or you should just stay at home and just wait for a better day. Okay, so this is uh, one beautiful day. You know, I live, I'm lucky to live near Chinese Garden. So the day that I took this picture, right, you look at the humidity and look at the viewpoint. Very, very rare day, okay? I remember I messaged him that day. And so like, I was telling him, hey, humidity is like at 58, you know? And I told him, and the dew point had dropped down to 21, I'm gonna make a run for it. And I literally, I just grabbed whatever gear I had, I just ran. And I ran there, and then it's like, just nice, sunset, okay, bam, shoot, we are done. <laughs> See, going by statistics, it works. And it also happens that the cloud looks very, very nice in that day, you know? See, we have a very, very nice mix of um, zero clouds, uh, cirrus clouds, and also alto clouds, you know? And a little bit of the, um, uh, of the cumulus clouds. And now, I know that you see this here that says cloud cover. You see, it does give us the cloud cover. Now, although this gives us an idea of how much cloud there is, I can tell you that they tend to give us a blanket number for the whole of Singapore. And this is never accurate. And I've given up on this cloud cover statistics because you can see that it says 83, but you go somewhere and it's like, that looks more like a 50. You can say it looks 50, you go to one location, it's like, that looks more like 90. So the cloud cover, don't trust it, okay? Because of wind factors, and because they give you one number for the whole of Singapore, which is very unrealistic, you know? It, it's, the one number is never, one location is bound to be uh, drastically different from another location, okay? So I tend not to trust cloud cover so much, tend to use your eyes a little bit more, and go, with, but humidity and dew point, this too can't go wrong, okay? Uh, temperature, doesn't really matter, but go with humidity and dew point. <laughs> Okay, so in Singapore we have, like I said, you know, we have very, very standard sunrise and sunset timings. But there are some parts of the world, like this is in Karashok in Finma. I was there in 2012, and this is a time lapse that I took. And this is a, over a period of four hours. The sunset was literally four hours. It took four hours for the sun to set. <laughs> you don't actually see the sun, but it, it, it really took a very because it was winter over there, and you only get about a few hours of sunlight. That's all the sunlight you get for the whole day. Okay, so this is a slide that probably you want to take a snap at. Uh, so, cloud cover, okay. If you want to trust the cloud cover, uh, a 30 to 70 percent cloud cover using your eyes probably will be a better idea. Uh, that, that, that is a, a good number that you want to have. If you want to have more clouds, you know, 70 percent, uh, again, this comes down to aesthetics, okay. Some people like to have more clouds, some people want to have less clouds. But generally, you don't want it to go above 70 percent or below 30 percent if you want to have clouds. Uh, you want to have mid to high level clouds, meaning, meaning your serious clouds, your zero clouds, and your auto clouds. Those are the, the high level clouds uh, that kind of forms very, very nice textures in the sky. Okay, uh, clean, you want to have clean air. So one of the things that we didn't actually talk about is that Singapore, we do have PSI level readings. So you obviously want a very low PSI reading. And in some countries, in, and, in some, and, in, and in some apps, they actually measure that in terms of visibility. It how far you can actually see. I tend to trust visibility a little bit more. I like to have very, very long, uh, long kilometers of visibility. Uh, low humidity, lower than 70% is great, okay? Uh, I wouldn't say that anything higher than 70 is bad because, as you know, the dew point matters more than the humidity. And on very, very rare days where you have high humidity but extremely low dew points, I would say still make a run for it because the, the moist air is always going to be on the high regions of uh, near the clouds, which is fine, okay? Uh, so low dew point, now very rarely in Singapore, you see dew point drop below 21. I think I've only happened to, I've only seen it myself on days where I check the apps, probably three or four times. That, that's, that's for the entire period of time that I started doing this, only three or four times. Most of the time, dew point is really, really high. But it's not to say that you will not have a good sunset. You, you don't forget the things like rain showers, all this, they, they, they do matter as well, okay? But then again, you know, I'm giving you all this information so that you can make an educated guess on how the sunset's gonna be, all right? And calm winds, okay? I can't stress that enough. Winds, wind is not, now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that high winds means terrible sunset. That's not what I'm trying to say. Strong winds means very difficult to predict. And it's almost like taking a crap shoot, roll the dice, you know? And for me, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to go out and shoot, you know, I want a higher percentage. I don't really want to roll the dice on whether or not the sunset's going to be great. So, try if you must, you know, but then again, you know, you're taking a gamble. 
Um, don't leave after sunset. There's always something called afterglow for the people who prefer sunset. And for people who prefer sunrise, uh, there is also something called first light, meaning that the sun hasn't actually risen yet. Okay? So afterglow and first light, they kind of look almost exactly the same. Again, it kind of goes back to the whole issue of sunrise or sunset. But uh, first light and afterglow, it tends to have very, very similar kind of features. But maybe just as a bit of a, uh, a uh, just, just, just a bit of a show of hands, like how many of you are more like sunrise people? <laughs> okay, see some hands. So can I assume that the rest of you are more like sunset people? <laughs> okay, so there are, there are pros and cons of, of sunset and sunrise, like you know. So like for me, you know, I'm a late riser. I tend to be more of a sunset person, uh, but. I actually came up with this like just before I came for the talk. So I thought, hey, people might be interested in this. Okay, let's 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 do a bit of a pros and cons, right? So sunrise, sunrise tends to have lower humidity, so that's great. You know, lower dew point as well. So that's one advantage. Okay, because sunset tends to have higher humidity and higher dew point as well. Okay, sunrise you don't get a cloud preview because at night you wake up in the morning, it's gonna be like dark. You know, so you don't get that three four o'clock preview that you get when you, as compared to when you're shooting the sunset, you can look out the window and see how the cloud is before you make a decision, all right? Sunrise, you have to wake up early to find out the, the conditions. So it's like, wake up, it's like, oh damn, it's not good, go back to sleep, okay? So, uh, but of course, in sunset, you don't have to wake up early to find out the condition. You're already awake, you're already at work, or you're already up and about, okay? Sunrise, good point. Probably less people in your shot because people tend to not to wake up so early, okay? So that's, that's definitely a pro. Uh, and sunset obviously pause. definitely gonna have a lot more people in your shop, okay? But the most important thing is you can't change where the sun rises and where the sun sets. So if like Chinese garden, you know, because I live near Chinese garden, Chinese garden is all like if you want to shoot that pagoda, it's always a sunset shot because the sun rises in the other direction. No way you can change that. So so what you want to shoot is also uh, restricted by where the sun rises and where the sun sets, okay? So that, all these are kind of things that kind of you have to factor in when you want to take a particular shot. Okay, the last thing that I want to talk about, and I don't really want to go a lot into this, you know, because these kind of information are probably going to be more available out there on the internet. You know, but since I'm doing a topic on sunrise and sunset, I might as well share this as well. Okay, so what are the equipment that I use? Uh, GND filters. So. What GND actually stands for, it stands for Graduated Neutral Density Filters. So if you look at the one on the right, it's shot without GND filters, and the one on the left is shot with GND filters. Of course, a uh, little bit of a boost of the colors uh, as well. Now the difference that you see is that because the GND filters, let's just go to the left, you can see that if you look at the left, they actually kind of uh, provides a bit of a, like a sunglass effect on the topmost region there, it filters out the light, and hence, it will block out the light on the upper region. You can slide the filter up and down to the point according to the horizon, and that tends to give you a much better sun, uh, a better sunrise or sunset. Now, I also got people asking me about sun, about sunset filters before, and sunset filters is the one that's orange on the right hand side. Now, nowadays, most of us have access to software that can tint the color and change the color. So, I think that my personal opinion is that sunset filters are a thing of the past. You, know, you can still use it if you want to, it just gives an orange tint on your sunset. You know, but you'll be better off if you have access to Photoshop or any imaging editing software, you'll be better off just doing it in the software itself. So obviously that's going to cost you money, you know, so we want to try to save costs as well. Only, and also you, the more filters that you bring out, you know, the more bulky your bag is going to be. So we only want to kind of bring out the... So I'm going to show you the, the only filters that I bring out. Uh, so this is uh, also shot on G, with a GND filter. And also you can see that because of the sunrise, uh, the... Is there any one of you? <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, so with, without the GND filter, this shot would not have been possible, you know. Is either I will blow out the, the horse and the horseman in the foreground, or I have to... Or, the, or you know, it's either that they become really, really dark or really, really blown. So that evens up everything for you. Now, GND filters, 
Jenny filters is uh, is good for first light and afterglow. Now, what is really really good for the point where the sun is just coming out or is just setting is this thing called the reverse GND filter. This is the second filter that I will put in my bag when I'm shooting the sunset. You notice that the difference between a reverse GND filter and a normal uh, GND filter is that the darkest part of it is actually right in the center and it kind of papers and, and, and just slowly gradually fades away towards the top that's because when the sun first comes out then this is the part that's going to be the brightest and that actually blocks out the majority of the, the harsh sunlight that's coming towards you so if you look at this diagram over here no filter it completely blows out okay even when you use a normal GND filter, the one that we were previously talking about. Yes, it filters up the top, but it's not strong enough. And you can see that the sun is still blown using a regular GND 1.2 filter. And on the right, you see that what you have is a reverse GND 0.6 filter. And what it does is that because the center part it blocks out most of the light, you that actually captures the sun and it slowly tapers and filters out towards the top. Okay, so that's what. So if you're shooting sunrise and sunset, these are the two most essential filters that you probably want to have in your bag: the GND filter and the reverse GND filter. Okay, and last but not least, is just regular ND filters. Now these don't have to be the one that kind of slide in and out. They can be even those circular ones that, because uh, there's no graduation in those filters. So a regular ND filter, because what it does. For you, even though it doesn't actually have any kind of graduated effect, it does allow you to increase your exposure timing. Okay, and why you want to increase your exposure timing is just so that sometimes you may. You, know, you see this shot here that I actually shot. Now on this day, right, there there wasn't really much colors in the sky, but I do notice that there's a lot of wind, and the wind is really blowing. And when the wind blows, right, it does expose up different segments of the sky. So I decided to just do a crap show. I just said, okay, let's just put on the darkest filter that I have, um, an ND, an ND10. And then I just ran it for 164 seconds on an F16. And then as the wind blows and as the clouds start to, to, to peel apart, you can start to see segments of the sky and segments of the sun starting to come out. So uh, yeah, using uh, ND filter allows you to create cloud movement, more colors maybe, possibly and more dramatic cloud movement effect as well. Okay, and one of the things that it actually does now, I come back to this shot again, is because when I went, this is a Sunday when this happened, okay? And obviously on a Sunday in Chinese garden, there are always going to be people there. There are going to be tourists there, there are going to be people hanging around the pagoda area. So when I, the moment I set my tripod, I'm like, okay, there are people here. Okay, you can't go there and shoot them away, you know, this can't do that. So what I did was I ran a really long exposure. I ran an 83 second exposure. So because there's a bit of wind on that day, it creates a little bit more of a dramatic cloud movement effect. But that's, that was actually not my, why I actually use the, uh, the long exposure. Because if you actually look, I, this is a one for one close up on the area where there were actually a lot of people. You can see that all the people are gone because of the long exposure, because the people walk. They walk from one place to the other. They don't stay, unless they stay stationary at one spot for very, very long. So long as they are moving, it actually, it saves you the trouble of going in to Photoshop out all the people. All the people just naturally disappear. Okay. Uh, and last but not least, if you don't have, if you don't want to spend so much money or you don't have the, the money for this kind of equipment yet, uh, and for this particular day, uh, silly me, I actually forgot to bring my filter back out, you know. So because it was really, really early in the morning, we had to get out. So I forgot to bring my filter back. So thought, okay, what the hell, you know, I don't have my filter back. So uh, let's do a bracketed exposure. That that will save the day. So on a re on a, a much lower, uh, much lower, much faster shutter speed, all the way down to a much lower shutter speed. Okay. So you can see here, the sun is completely blown. Uh, now this is not a session of HDR, so I don't want to go too much on the techniques of HDR, but one of the things that I've learned through the years about doing HDR right, is that don't go for that shot. You know, you always have that one shot if you do like a plus two or plus three that is like completely blown. That shot is actually completely not necessary because you'll probably, that will probably end up destroying your shot more than saving your shot. So this is probably as far exposed. In fact, it's a darker shot that is actually more important and I'll tend to skew it more towards the underexposed shot to save my sun rather than having that super overexposed shot that's two or three stops over. This is probably like a plus one, and this is as far as I'll go. And that's like maybe like a minus five or minus six over there. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so when you combine them all together, you know, you get, you still have your sun, and everything will be nice and well balanced. Okay, so bracketed exposure saves the day. Right, so that's actually the uh, end of my presentation. Okay, so um, let's take some questions. Any any questions from the floor? <laughs> I know it's a lot to take in. Okay, and I don't know if I kind of actually went too crazy with the uh, with the numbers and all the deal points and all the things. There was a lot of things that I considered when I was preparing this presentation. Um, anything that you guys? Yes, sir. Because my exposures have really what you should ignore and change the what the uh, oh, so you're saying that shooting a raw with a higher bit rate, so so you does get a more dynamic range, you know, as a result. Okay, yes, uh, that's true. You know, if, if you guys are aware of that, that shooting a raw, you know, you do get uh, 14, so sometimes even 16 bit. Of, so you can actually recover the. So I think that for like Canon and Nikon cameras, they can go anywhere between 13 to 14 stops, you know, based on uh, the on a raw setting. But I can tell you that even with that number of stops, right, it's still not enough to cover the entire sunset and sun, sunrise and sunset, right, have an uh, extremely high number uh, range of, of brightness uh, value from very, very dark to very, very bright. And I don't actually think, now even if I go back here, right, you can actually see that this particular shot, you know, the, 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 the sun is still blown. And, and this particular shot, right, you know, you can see that this, we save this area here, these, these areas here, you can see that's really down there, but the sky is, the sun is completely low. So even this is shot raw, it's not possible to actually capture the entire range, you know. So I think that we still need at least maybe three or four different bracketed shots to, for us to get the whole range in, if you're not using a filter. Of course, if you have a filter, then the situation could change a lot as well, yeah. So, okay, good, good start. You know, any, any other questions? Uh, anything that you... <laughs> That's you. <laughs> okay, it's a uh, it's much better turnout than I expected. On, 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 on like, how do how do you guys find out about this uh, this uh, talk by the way? Because uh, the, the Facebook response like looked quite miserable, and I thought that huh, probably not a lot of people are gonna turn out. <laughs> there, there is an app like in the drive. Uh huh. Okay. We uh, we are like from SMJ University. So we, sorry from where? Like SMJ University. Okay. So we are like a photography club in the Right, right. So maybe we were looking for like events that we can like learn about photography more. Mm -hmm. So I found it on that app. Right, I, right. I just typed like photography events and then it just popped up for certain event. Right. So I suppose Leon put it on event right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Um yeah, so so is this the first time you're joining us? Yeah, okay, great. You know, so not all our topics are on photography, you know, sometimes we deal with different areas, but we tend to have photography talks uh, from time to time. And you can just check, join our Facebook group, uh, Creative Crew, and we always post, post our topic uh, ahead of time. And it's always on the second Tuesday of the month, and always here. But the location is always the same, we are sponsored by the library. And what's your Facebook group? Yeah, look for Creative Crew Singapore. Creative Crew, C R E W. Sorry, sir, you were asking? Actually, it's interesting that, that you ask because we are we're kind of looking for a new direction in our in our group. You know, so we are looking for we are actually thinking of more maybe hands-on practical session. You know, like we, we were actually trying because nowadays, right? You know, it's like a lot of information can kind of like be found online. You know, so it's like when I decided to do this talk, you know, I, I will only do a session like this if I feel that that information cannot be found online. There's not like any classes that you can actually do on this. Then I thought, okay, maybe it's good to have like a master class like this, you know, where I can share my information. Otherwise, you know, you'd be better better off just googling and youtubing your results, right? Uh, the kind of answers that you want. But hands-on stuff, you know, that's that's kind of the trend of where it's kind of going more towards, you know. So we are also still trying to firm up our agenda for next year, like how we want to kind of run this. But that is definitely one of the things that we are thinking about, you know, doing more group hands-on kind of stuff and only doing formal talks when there's common topics like this where people have an interest in then we'll do formal talks like this. But other than other than that right now we'll just do you know outings. Yeah. Mm. So is there like a among your photography group do you guys always organize outings to go out and shoot in Singapore? Yeah. Mm. And where do you where do you guys normally go? Uh, we haven't started yet. We just mm -hmm. like maybe like Okay, well you I think you have a Right, great. Oh, I'm so honored. First activity. Oh my God. You know, you have a lot of fellow enthusiasts here. You know, uh, 
yeah, around, I'm lucky to live around Chinese Garden and also I have a lot of uh, 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 friends that I know, they, they are, a lot of them are bird enthusiasts, you know, they like to go to Chinese Garden you know, with their long lenses. And so I run into them in the morning when I'm there. I'm more of a macro guy, you know. So I'm there with my tiny lens and they're there with their big lens. Um, yeah, so, um, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. And my question is most people who are the group from San Francisco US. Oh sorry, from from where? Okay, we did a lot. Oh sunsets, okay. Uh, that's a good question actually. Yeah. Uh, Actually, you know, surprisingly, right, you know, like, I, I've actually researched that before. And surprisingly, the, the, even though the sun sets in the west, the, the recommended spots are always in the east. You know, have you guys noticed that before? Like, they will always recommend Pongo, you know, Changi Broadwalk, you know, and, and places like that. Uh, one very good place to find information is Club Snap. You know, Club Snap, I think, uh, those of you who are local probably have heard of Club Snap before. Places where people go and buy and sell or buy used equipment. But they, there's, a, there's a huge forum there, probably Singapore's biggest forum. And people will always give recommendations. They will, have, they will post like results. Okay, I shot this here this, on this day. Yeah. So if you want to know where to go, you know, like for, for me, um, I've, in, I, I'm not that, I would say that I'm not particularly keen on shooting sunsets in Singapore because um, the, I'm a statistics person and it's never really turned out that well for me. On, on very rare days, like the one that I showed, the Chinese Garden one, yeah, if I see the statistics are flavorful, then I'll make a run for it. So for me, I'll shoot wherever I'm near. Okay, if I'm near and the conditions work for me, then I will look what's around me, if the sky is favorable, and I'll go to the nearest nice photogenic spot for me to shoot. Yeah. So that I have time to set up and, and, and stuff like that. I always have my camera with me, just, just my camera. It's always with me, my lenses are in my car, and my tripods are in my car as well. So I'm always ready to go. I'm like filter, back, everything's all there as well. Yeah. So one of the things that you can you should do is to always be prepared. Always be prepared at any point of time. That the the, the, the the stats are in favor, just go for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes ma'am. Mm -hmm. Uh you talk about the like, how to make a perfect sunset and you need to take care of the people and community. How about you want to take like a very dark or like, cloudy? Uh, very 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 what sorry, very dark? Dark or like, cloudy sky. Sunset or not the sun. If you just want clouds alone, you, know, you it doesn't necessarily have to be sunset then I suppose. If you just want to take you just want to take pictures of nice, cl nice clouds, right? You know, with with or without the landscape. Or just just the sky. Hmm. So you're just shooting the sky or just shooting the land the, the buildings as well. Just the clouds alone, yeah. I, th I think with that, right, you know, you, you pretty much just need to look up into the sky, you know, and, and look at how, because you're not particularly looking at sunset clouds, are you? Just just regular clouds? No, yeah. dark clouds. Oh, dark clouds. Okay, right. So, uh, I, I would say go, I'll, I'll, I'll just make a guess and say go with the weather prediction app because, and this is a good time of the year to be doing it because this is the rainy season, this is the monsoon season and it's, it's been practically raining every day, you know, so uh, this will be the best time of the, of the year for you. Yeah. And, and I think that where you live also kind of helps as well, you know, like I have a friend who li lives right next to uh, the Capel Harbour when he's facing the sea, he has the most amazing lightning shots because he's literally facing the sea, you know. So where you stay, you know, I'm lucky to stay near Chinese Garden, you know, so, yeah, so um, make, take advantage of where you live, you know, and find out, and, and you, you, you know that by, in terms of proximity, you are always going to be more accessible to those places around you. And by the time, if you have a nice sunset in the east, by the time you get there, you know, it's like probably the sunset might be gone already. <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions? Mm. Yes, sir. How would you like to sunset? One leg, one leg, one leg. Actually, it, it, a lot of people would, would tend to go for wide lenses, right? You know, I, I've shot really nice sunsets with, uh, with long lenses before. You know, and, and long lenses, uh, I don't know if you guys actually shot, saw the picture. I don't actually have the picture with me, but the one that I used for my Facebook post, you know, and that's with all the birds in the foreground, that was actually shot on 200mm. And because that actually allows me to have a really, really big sun. 
in, in the back. So, and, and I decided to do that because the clouds weren't that fantastic that day. You know? So I thought, oh well, you know, I have birds around, you know, so I might as well take that shot. So just to debunk the myth that you always need a white lens you know, for, for nice sunset, and it's not true. You, know? you, can, you can shoot nice, nice sunsets with a, with a zoom lens as well, a prime lens uh, as well. You know? there's, no, there's no rule that says that you can only use white lenses. Mm-hmm. Yes? Um, when it comes to like ND filters, mm-hmm. um, there are like really cheap ones and yeah. like very expensive ones. Is it like a good investment to like, uh, spend on the expensive ones or like really cheap ones and prices? Is there like, is there, like a big difference between the cheap ones? Because like cheap ones and the expensive ones are like cheap. It's just like a really big gap yeah, especially you go for like the Lee filters, you know, versus like the cheaper brands. Yeah, I, I get where you're coming from, you know. And a, a lot of the time, you know, you have a lot of these blog posts on my results, you know. Especially with the darker ND filters, one of the things that people tend to look out for is the blue tint. Because the dark, the, the more stop it drops, it tends to have a higher chance of it leaving a blue tint behind. Uh, that's one of... Um, obviously, if you spend... Uh, you, if you spend spend more money, you know, they, they, the, 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 I mean, there's a branding involved in there as well. I, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, this is any kind of like, because uh, when you go into branding, it's like it becomes like endorsement, you know. So, and one of the things that we, we promise not to do, you know, in, in our group is like we, we don't want any commercial endorsement of any kind of like brands, you know, and stuff like that, you know. So, uh, per, personally, you know, for those that I use, it's not true that the more expensive brands are, are always better than the cheaper. I've used cheaper brands before that actually gave better results than the more expensive brands. So these kind of things, you know, I think it's better if you go and read up on the forums, you know, and sometimes, right, you know, the blog posts, I find that, don't you guys find that blog posts are becoming more and more unreliable? You don't know if they're being paid to do it, and then sometimes it's like, yeah, you know, this guy's saying this, and you know, it's kind of like con- contradicting all the information that people are. So I think that community forums are still more reliable than this kind of paid because blog posts, because we don't even know whether or not these, whether or not people are being said. So I could have sent a set of filters to this guy here. So this guy is a blogger and said, "Hey, it's for you. you know, try it out." Of course, he's going to say good things about my set of filters. You know, I gave it to him for free. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, rely on community, rely on these kind of forums. You know, you know, those will probably give you a much better, yeah, choices. Mm. Yes, sir. What is the What is sorry? My company, okay, I, uh, I actually, for now, for me, I am now lecturing professionally uh, at a polytechnic. Okay, uh, they just had a rule now on my poly that I'm not allowed to say which poly I teach at, but it's somewhere nearby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm now actually teaching professionally, but I used to be in the creative field, you know, so I, do, I used to do, so everything that you see on my website, I used uh, photography and I'm also a motion designer as well. So, yeah, that's my background, that's my past. Mm. Yeah, but I tend to focus more a lot on food photography in the past. But of course, you know, when you're a photographer, you shoot everything. Um, I don't think that it's very lucrative as a sunset photographer. Let's just put it that way. You know. But it's something, I, I, and I think that you know, all of us do come here and we do this not for the money. You know, we love it for the passion. And we just love doing it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, it's not a mask, but you will, you will save you a lot. Of, let, let's just put it this way, okay? It's either you put in a lot of time uh, in post, or you spend a, you spend money, or you always spend time, right? They, they always, they always, so it's the same with photography. So if you spend the money on the filter, that will save you a lot of time in post processing. Like if you want to do all the bracketed shots and all the HDR, that's going to take you a lot of time. And and of course, there are some things that you can't do bracketed shots. Like the re, there's a reason why I show that horse picture. This picture here. Yeah, this this can't be a bracketed shot because the horse moves and the, the horseman moves as well. So when the thing moves, you know, you can't do a bracketed shot. Yeah, I would say it's impossible, but it's so hard to do a, a bracketed shot. Yeah. So in filters, in situations where they are moving subjects, yeah, I would say you know filters definitely have a one half. You know, but if you don't want to invest in it yet, you know, go with the bracketed exposure. You know, it, it will give you similar kind of results. No, 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 no. Okay. Minus three and plus three. I won't go two plus three. It actually it depends on the situation, you know. But like I said, you know, like like this one that I showed you guys from this is just from my experience, you know, and I know that people might disagree with me. I know that we, we tend to go right in the middle, right? And then you have like a minus, 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 and you have plus, plus, plus. 
I tend to skew all the way down on the left side, leaving only a plus one shot on this side here. And you can see that actually everything here is on a minus all the way down there. Because when you're shooting directly into the sun, the sun is very, very bright. And you can see that the la only in the last two shots where you can actually see the sun, right? The rest of it is like mostly blown. So for me, right, I tend to, I feel that the darker shadows are actually more important, uh, the, the darker shots are more important because it actually saves your highlights. Over here, right, you can see that to this point here, right, we actually have enough shadows already. This is actually enough for, for you, right, to have details in your shadows. That's good enough. We don't need one step higher to blow out all the details there. It's not necessary. Yeah. Your photo will also become looking more like a painting Hi, rather than a natural so photo. <laughs> Okay, um, so if there are no other questions, okay, I'll, I'll, you can still come up to me and ask me anything if you want to ask me anything in person. Uh, but after this, uh, we're gonna... actually, I have a question for you guys. Okay, sure. What, um, what kind of photography talks will you be interested in? If let's say, you know, if there's something about photography that you always wanted to know how to do, but you guys never ever could find the information, don't know how to get it done, or something along that line that you're curious about. Is there anything, you know, a topic on photography that you guys would like to, to hear about? Staging a photo shoot. Sorry? Staging a photo shoot. Staging a photo like shoot. Photo oh, like uh, like portraiture photography with, with a model. Okay. Like outdoors or indoors in the, in the studio? Outdoors, outdoors or indoors in the studio? Indoors in the studio. Indoors in the studio, okay. Uh, mm. uh, right. Uh, yeah, that, that is possible. Uh, I, uh, if, if, if I mean, it, I, I actually do have a studio that I have access to. We actually did that before. Yeah, we, we actually kind of did that before, but it was not really in the studio. We actually did it somewhere in an NTUC building where we actually turn off the lights and then we try to simulate a studio environment. So we, we actually did that once, you know. But it probably cannot accommodate a big enough room, but I do have a studio that I can use, even in the after hours. So uh, I, I suppose we can try to do a poll or something online, you know, if there's enough interest, we can yeah, probably do an online shoot, you know. I'm just kind of interested, like, which kind of direction, I mean, what is it that um, you guys, what kind of information you guys like to actually know? I mean, what kind of education you like to get, so to speak? Because, you know, we, Seldom we get so many um, photographers in the room. I'm just wondering what kind of stuff do you actually like to, to get? Huh? Time lapse. Time lapse, okay. Yeah, a lot, a lot of the newer cameras that build in now, that, that one is actually quite easy to do, okay. That, that one is doable, we just need to find a location we can do that. Huh? What is it? Time lapse. Oh, time, time lapse. Time lapse photography. Time lapse. Yeah. So, okay, yeah, so maybe what we can do, you know, I, I, I suppose we can like maybe set up a poll on, on Facebook, you know, people can like vote for topics, maybe. Oh, uh, I actually did a talk on travel photography before, and we actually covered that topic. Okay, when you want to travel, do photography when you're traveling, don't travel with these friends. <laughs> travel with these friends. <laughs> yeah. Travel is very important. <laughs> they are, oh, don't stereotype them. <laughs> this is not nice. <laughs> yes. Do you be normally set up an app for uh, the rest to have the information on the monthly uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we, we actually, it's a Facebook group. Uh, it's called, uh, if you go on, if you have a Facebook account, you know, uh, look for Creative Crew Singapore. Singapore. Creative, Creative Crew Singapore. All right. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, if you, uh, we will usually post our monthly topic uh, on creative. creative crew C R E W. Can you go to No internet. <laughs> this this is uh, this is a third. Kim Ming, can you project? Not from my own. Huh? Facebook. Okay. No, not not on Facebook. No. Um, can you just write Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> write it down. Uh, let's see what. Okay. Can I type type it down. I suppose. What can I use to type? Uh, uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I suppose we can just type it here. Okay. Right. Uh, we do. So we go to Facebook. Okay. And then look for 
creative. No, no, there, there. This um, one. Okay, you go to this. It's not, not going to open, but... Yeah, but you, that's the URL. That's the URL, yes. Slash group, slash... Group. Yeah, if you go to the URL, that's our creative group. Uh, that's yeah. our group. Uh, unfortunately, the library does not give us any Wi-Fi to use. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, so maybe we, what we can do is we can take a poll then, you know. I think yeah, I, uh, we are also we are also we are also gonna have dinner at Caesarea and also feel feel free to join us. You know, usually we have a little bit of a dinner supper session with the uh, with the uh, people the attendees. Uh, so if you haven't had your dinner, you know, feel free to join us. We'll just give us a bit of time to pack up and we're just gonna make our way over there. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, but the studio session is definitely I think I think I think Chen at the back there he also yearning for it. He he loves studio sessions, yeah. So <laughs> so yeah, I know we can we can probably set up something. Okay. Yeah.